Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is Steve Horwitz. He's the Distinguished Professor of Free Enterprise in the Department of Economics in the Miller College of Business at Ball State University. And starting this month, he's the new economics editor at libertarianism.org. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Steve. Hey, guys. Glad to be back. You've spent a lot of years teaching economics. In that time, have things gotten better or worse when it comes to the public's understanding of economic issues? Well, if we ignore for the moment the president, perhaps. <laughs> uh, Please, can we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think it's gotten better. Um, I, I think there, there are some basic, the basic kind of stuff that economists care about. I think the public sort of gets. I mean, and, and at one level, right, we're not debating well, I shouldn't say that so quickly, but we're really not debating capitalism versus socialism anymore with a few outliers to be noted. I mean, the, the idea that markets generally are are the way to go and, and, and understanding the basic ideas, why that is. I mean, if you, you know, even the people we think of as being critics of market, like a, like a Krugman or someone like that, still at the end of the day, the, the sort of you know, uh, uh, median spot where 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 people and the public, I think, are with respect to these issues, is better in many ways than it was a couple generations ago, for sure. Um, there's still issues, right, that that are problems. Uh, you know, thinking carefully about inequality, for example, and 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 why you know what economics has to say about that, um, I think is important. But in general, yeah, I do think things are better. And I think part of the reason things are better, I actually think there's more people teaching and, uh, uh, you know, doing public intellectual work in economics who, who get it, uh, who really are, understand economics, are good at explaining it and, and get, I think, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that markets work and why they work and so on. Would you include like Freakonomics in that example of good teaching of economics or at least getting people to think about costs and benefits in a different way? Yeah. You know, I think Freakonomics is, I think of as kind of the, you know, the, the teaser for economics. It makes economics really sexy in some ways. Uh, and, and, uh, and it does, it is good if we think of economics as the economic way of thinking. I think that kind of stuff is really good. Same with Pete Leeson's new book, uh, which is you know similar to Freakonomics in that way, um, you know. So that in that sense, yeah, um, I, I'm not sure that those things, you know, move move the the sort of economics that you need to understand the big policy questions all that far. But they certainly get people interested in economics, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and and I think the general, I mean, the success of Freakonomics, for example, is an indicator of of just sort of a more general interest in economic in economics as a, as a thing that I think was the case even when I started grad school in the 80s. So if the public's understanding is at least getting marginally better, does the same hold true at among university students? I mean, we hear that, you know, that you kind of, if you listen to the media now, it sounds like the university has run so far left that they're all Maoists um, <laughs> and, and that it's, that's often driven by the students themselves. So what, what have the... The last decades looked like among, say, undergraduates. Yeah, I, so I think I think it's it, you have to be careful here because you know if I, I'm, there's a selection bias problem for me since I tend you know if I'm teaching economics majors, right? It, I'm going to get a different view. But if I think about the students I've taught, say, in intro classes over the years, I, I don't think there's there's certainly by my measures no significant move to the left. Um, and if anything, a slight move towards towards sort of better, you know, better appreciating again markets. Not a big one, but but slight. And one of the things I really found, again, especially teaching intro, uh, both both at St. Lawrence and now at Ball State, is how uh, what's the word I want here? How how little students really know uh, as the basis for their opinions before they walk into an economics class. And I think one of the great things about teaching economics, again, particularly intro, is the ability to sort of get students to see issues in ways they never thought about before. And at the very least, to get them to recognize uh, it's a lot more complicated than their simple slogans would suggest. For example, the rich are getting rich, the poor are getting poorer, or women make 80% of what men make. I mean, those kind of things we see knocked around. Students come in with those, presumably from high school, which is a whole other question. Um, but, but I think one economics class 
at the very least gets those students to understand that the, that the issues are more complicated than that. Uh, when you when you teach your intro class, do you kind of focus it to look at the trendy misconceptions or at least conceptions that are missing the complexity of questions like the gender pay gap? Do you try and focus that on addressing some of those issues to keep the students interested? I, I certainly try to bring them up uh, as as examples. I, I One of the changes I've made over the years, I, I really spend a full week on two issues that I think uh, where, where, where I think are those sorts of things. One is a week on environmental economics, right? And, and one of my favorite days in intro is when I argue that the optimal quantity of pollution is not zero. <laughs> I say that, that all, I say that all uh, the time. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that that blows the minds of students. And my students at St. Lawrence in particular were very sort of green and crunchy, and and they, they didn't quite know what to do with that. But it but it stuck. I you know I had evidence that it stuck with them, uh, and I thought that was a victory for the economic way of thinking. At least if we understand there's a cost to pollution reduction. So that's one week. And I spend another full week on the on the inequality stuff, and I have a whole sort of series of videos and 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 sort of class discussions that that go with that because I think that issue is really important. Gender wage gap, I do you know it comes up when we when we talk about labor markets, but but I don't focus on that too much. I've historically I've taught a whole course on the economics of gender, where essentially you know a huge hunk of the course is about thinking through the, the gender wage gap. Uh, and there too, it's the same same thing. I think where students who've never thought about it before suddenly are sort of wow, you know, it, okay, it's more complex. And I, it's fascinating to watch college age women kind of work their way through that too. So, so yeah, I think the answer is yeah. I mean, I, I do think the other thing though is that that in teaching an intro class, you, you certainly want to get students engaged by showing them how economics is applicable. It doesn't always have to be to the sort of big political issues. And, and as I'm talking, I'm also realizing I'm in the last two years, unsurprisingly, I spend more time talking about uh, using international trade examples, right, than than I would have before, thanks to the to the you know orange man. <laughs> so uh, taking taking a big step back, um, how did you get interested in economics to begin with? Oh well, okay. So uh, there's some family history here. My, my dad uh, is a PhD in accounting and taught finance and accounting and was business school dean for 11 years. His brother, my uncle, never finished his PhD in economics, but, but uh, came close and, and for, it was an, actually a practicing econometrician. It sounds like a practicing, you know, voodoo artist or something. But anyway, um, but practicing econometrician for decades, right? So, so there's some of that. And, and their first cousin my, my, uh, is a math professor, just retired at Penn. So there's all that in my blood. But the, the, the story for me is uh, I became a libertarian at age about 16 and uh, like seriously. And when I went to college, I was going to be a computer science major and I needed a fifth course second semester of my freshman year and I thought to myself if if you're going to keep talking about this libertarianism stuff you better learn some economics young man um, so I took intro econ as a fifth course just for that reason and had the experience I think that that almost every economist has at some point where the sort of scales fall from your eyes and you go wow okay yes right I, I've all and for me it was yeah I've always sort of understood the world this way now I have this systematic way of thinking and talking about it. And it was so easy and so natural for me that I was like, oh, this is what I want to do, right? I want you know, more, please. Uh, what so what is me, it was, what know. is this, you say, thinking about the world this way? And a, a lot of people who aren't, who ha don't spend time hanging out around economists and aren't <laughs> reading all this stuff, think of economics as just like, you're just kind of studying money. Yeah. Um, that it's almost, uh, it's indistinguishable almost from like the accounting that your dad did, um, but what? So what is this way? And you talk about, and you've talked about in the past, the economic way of thinking. I think the easiest way to talk about it is 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 understanding that uh, human choices are made on the basis of our of uh, us uh, determining the marginal benefits and marginal costs of each choice we make. So, and by marginal here, we mean. Um, if I take this next step, if I make this next choice, what are the benefits that come from this choice? What are the costs of this choice? And all the stuff I've done in the past, right? You know, it doesn't, we talk about what we call sunk costs. That doesn't matter. It's thinking about the world in terms of, 
of, of, of that kind of cost benefit analysis, thinking about the, ter- the world in terms of people respond to incentives. How do, how do, you know, what are the, you know, we want to understand people's choices. What are the incentives they're facing? What knowledge do they have available to them? How does that inform their, their, their choices? Um, I'm dedicated enough to the economic way of thinking and, and married a woman who, you know, is an ado- adoptee, an adoptee of some of the economic way of thinking that our wedding rings are actually engraved with MB greater than MC, which is basically <laughs> the economist way of saying it, it was worth it, right? <laughs> uh, I've just got to wrap my brain around that for a second. Uh, yeah, it's, J- even I, you guys may know Jacob Levy, but Jacob Levy called that the geekiest thing he'd ever heard of. Now, <laughs> that, that's, come, that's a lot, yeah. That's yeah, saying that's a lot. Like, yeah. So was he, that your idea or hers? Actually, it was hers. <laughs> so, so you well, I'm sticking around. You mentioned the choice aspect. W- would it be fair to say that economics is rooted in individual choice? Because sometimes I see economics that doesn't seem to be talking about choices that much. I'm thinking of big macro equations or monetary theory or things like this that that don't really talk about individual choice. Yeah, I th- I think that's correct. It it is or at least should be rooted in individual choice. Um and and again, you know, ultimately only individuals choose. Of course, individuals make choices within the context of organizations like households and firms and, and nonprofits and so on. So, but but even when we say things, you know, we say things like Walmart lowered its prices today. I mean, we're it's that's fine, but we also recognize it's a bit of a metaphor. It really means it's that some individuals within the organization we call Walmart just. Decided to right to, to make to, to make that change. So yeah, it is rooted in individual choice. And and I think the other way of thinking about that is my my friend Pete Betke would say, you know, all all good economics is relative price economics, right? It's about individuals facing the the, the prices of various goods and making their decision based on the relative price, the price of one good compared to another. So when we think about things like macro, part of the problem with macro, uh, standard macro is that that again. Yeah, it's not rooted in individual choice. It's sort of looking at the way in which aggregates bump into each other and are correlated with each other. Um, I think there's ways to do macro that that get it back to individual choice. I wrote a, a whole book about it and, and have done other things on it. But yeah, in the end, good economics is about, about tracing out the patterns of unintended consequences that emerge from the choices individuals make uh, uh, in, in the face of uncertainty and, and based on the, the, the information and incentives created by, by the price system. What does that then have to do with money? I mean, where do we get – so like what you've described sounds so different from the – you know, if if you say I'm, I, I'm an economist and what people think you do, um, that why – what's this big disconnect? The way that uh, Mises would have put it is we we study – Economics is this sort of broad category of, you know, the study of human action, right? As he called, he wanted to actually call it sociology. I think it he wanted the term sociology for it. But within that sort of broad sort of study of human action, which is kind of what I've just described, right? Mises also talked about what he called catalactics, which is the study of economic exchange and monetary exchange in particular. So when when economists historically, at least certainly, talked about economics, we were thinking in terms of, of, of you know, the prices that emerge from people exchanging money for goods. And we, we certainly talk about, you know, how to, you know, how do firms profit maximize and all those kind of questions that are, that are money questions. But the, but the principles that underlie that analysis can be extended to any situation that involves, again, sort of, you know, constraint, many times like constrained optimization, but certainly any situation where where we face scarcity, where we have to make choices, where we have to uh, where we can you know we have to act on the basis of de- determining benefits and costs, and the work of people like certainly Gary Becker and others in the mid 20th century that extended economics sort of outward in its imperial march from from money and finance into areas like the family and sort of other places that that were you know uh, occupied by other by other disciplines uh, certainly is is evidence of that. That kind of the fact that economics is really a, about human action and choice, right? Just so happens that a lot of those, the ones that interest us most frequently, are the ones that involve money and prices and so on. I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about the 
a little sketch of economics in the 20th century in the sense of one person we always hear about is, is Samuelson, for example, and the influence of people like Paul Krugman and how that all kind of fits together within the professional economist discipline that, that you're in and the influences and, and the people who are kind of disagreeing with that. How does that, how does that work and how has that been in history? Well, let's see if we can condense this down. Um, <laughs> so I, I think the, the, the key couple of key events here, you know, uh, sort of economics really until about the 1920s was was uh, primarily, for lack of a better term, a kind of literary discipline in the sense that 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 most of economics, if you pick up an economics book from, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century, it's mostly words. Uh, and, and if there's math, it's in the footnotes. And I think what happened in the 20s and 30s uh, was uh, economists, but changes in, in, in sort of philosophical understanding of science and economists wanting to, you know, getting a bad case of physics envy, uh, began to think that that the way you did science was was through quantification and modeling and so on. Um, and in the 20s and 30s, that approach, uh, which which grew out of some economics of the late 19th century in, in, legit, in legitimate ways, began to become dominant. I think there's an interesting story to be told about World War II, which sort of created incentives for economists to continue to, to, to develop those kind of mathematical models, and certainly the Great Depression, where where economists were sort of you know relied upon to get us out of this mess, even though arguably we were somewhat responsible for getting us in it, um, and and also sort of the Keynesian models that developed in the 1930s. Where were these sort of aggregate models that required measurements and required sort of quantification? And so by the by the end of World War II, the discipline has become much more uh, both uh, you know, sort of theoretically quantified and empirically through econometrics quantified. And a guy like you know what Samuelson does is sort of writes two books: the Foundations, his book, the Foundations book, which was sort of the the, the one for the economist, but then his Principles textbook. Um, which both both of which sort of laid out economics as this sort of mathematical applied mathematical discipline, um, and and those textbooks were used for the generations in, in undergraduate and graduate school. My joke about my my dad is that that he might you know um, he's kind of a is he's still alive sort of a, a, a moderate liberal ACLU Democrat type right, but but he has this incredible sort of understanding of private property and incentives and so on. And he, he might well have been a libertarian if he hadn't had Samuelson's textbook when he was in college. <laughs> That's my joke. So, but, but even Samuelson's book really was, it wasn't about the ideology, by the way, but though the ideology was, was awful in it. In fact, you know, he has that famous graph that the Soviets would pass us, right? That, that he kept revising edition after edition when it turned out not to be true. But the real thing that people like Samuelson did was to, to, to sort of recast economics uh, as this exercise in constrained optimization all the time, right? And that's and that is still fundamentally the way it's taught today, uh, you know. Uh, and and uh, there have been changes and advances, and and I think the the big the big change since the '60s or '70s, in some ways, the late '60s were about the worst period for economics. It was both quantitative in those ways. But it was also completely bought into the sort of Keynesian demand management story and the market failure story and the belief that government could solve problems was was tremendous. And then we get the public choice revolution. We get other kinds of changes, plus the empirical failure of both socialism and, and Keynesianism. Um, and since the 70s, sort of while the discipline remains highly quantitative in all those ways, the kind of work that are done by public choice economists, by Austrian school economists, by what so-called new institutional economists that really um, give much more scope to much more uh, treat, mar treat markets as having be much more robust than we thought before, and recognizing how brittle government is uh, has sort of changed the, the the kind of way textbooks treat things. I think if you looked at a textbook today versus you know 40, 50 years ago, it would be more sympathetic to markets than it was back then. You mentioned this term constrained optimization. It sounded like you were kind of negative about what that what that means well, and, and what does that mean <laughs> well it simply means that that what what the fundamental insight of economics is that that we're always we have preferences there are things we'd like to do uh and think goals we'd like to accomplish 
but we're always facing constraints. Uh, our knowledge is scarce, resources are scarce, everything's scarce, right? And so what we try to do is optimize uh, given our preferences and given those constraints, what's the best we can do? And, and, I, and I, I think that, you know, as I've just stated it, I think that's perfectly fine. What it often becomes, uh, you know, in the economics textbooks and economics courses, you can draw this up using calculus and, and you have to make all kinds of assumptions about the stability of people's preferences and that everybody knows all the prices they face and so on, right? It just ignores the sort of rich uncertainty and complexities of actual human life when we try to model it in that strict way. But the basic insight that we're always, even though we're often uncertain about what our preferences might be and exactly what the constraints are, we, we still go through life, you know, uh, facing that, uh, engaging in, in acts of constrained optimization. Um, we probably don't actually optimize, we, we, we sort of uh, muddle through somehow, uh, but still thinking about how do I, you know, how do I uh, get the most out of the situation that I'm in. What's what's the best course of action for me, given what I'd like to accomplish and given the constraints I face? That's that's the basic economic attitude right there. We started this conversation with you saying that public's understanding of economics was, if not good, at least getting better. That said, the the public gets a lot wrong, and so I wondered if you could tell us what you think. Like, what are some of the the kind of most pervasive or harmful or as an economics professor frustrating myths that the public believes about economics yeah um, so a couple of things I would say here I think the 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 two biggest global ones are not <clears throat> are, are the belief that economic activity is a zero-sum game that that someone's when someone wins, someone benefits. That means someone else is losing. And and so sort the of flip side of that, not understanding that exchange is mutually beneficial and interactions in markets are mutually beneficial. I think that's the that that at the fundamental level, that's that's a big one. Um, I, I also think of, I can I'm going to give you three. I think the second one is um, the belief that economies require some level of design and 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 construction in order to be successful. Uh, again, flipping it the other way, an inability to see the possibility of what Hayek called spontaneous order or undesigned or, or order or unintended order. And and for me with students, I often work on that uh, with, uh, you know, sort of if you think biological evolution, Darwinian evolution is correct, <laughs> and that, which I'm not convinced all of them do, but let's assume that they do, right? Right. You already understand what undesigned order is, and you don't have a, you know, you you are fine with it in the natural world, right? This is just the social world story, same same kind of story. So, so you're think, you're advocating social Darwinism, is what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't got that one yet. And actually, the joke, of course, is, and when they, if anyone ever raised that, right, the, the joke is that that historically it was the reverse, right? Darwin took that idea from the Scots, right? So we should call biology. Right, you know, uh, natural Smithianism or something like that, right? Because, because he he took it from them. Um, I think the third one is, is a little more subtle one, uh, and it's more of a macro one. But the idea that consumption drives the economy, right? That if we just buy more stuff, things are better, right? And and, and that's just that's just wrong. Um, and it's it, it's it's wrong in the sense that that what really ultimately matters is production, investment are what create wealth consumption, as the name suggests, consumes it. Um, but the other part of that is when we think about the business cycle, people say, oh, we have to get out of the recession by, you know, by, by, by beefing up consumption. Well, in fact, consumption is the least cyclical of all the components of GDP. Consumption stays fairly constant across the business cycle. What goes up and down is investment. You know you're in a recession when, when business people aren't investing. So the real secret to getting to avoiding business cycles is to not you know, uh, not not have those changes in, in problematic changes in investment. And if you're in a recession, you want policies that encourage firms to invest. Uh, so that's another one that I find, and that that one is all over the popular media and, and sort of in people's heads that that when they buy stuff, they're doing a good thing for the economy. Now you mentioned these three, which are sort of theoretical problems with how people are looking at different policy issues. But previously, you also mentioned inequality a couple of times, which. I've noticed has become an accepted truth over the last 10 or so years 
that everyone has to acknowledge that inequality is in, is increasing. Uh, but but you you said you you challenge that idea, or at least it's not as simple as people think. Yeah. Um, it, so uh, what I like to say is is it's it might be true that measured income inequality compared at two points in time is increasing. So given how we measure it, right? Usually sort of some measure of household income. And if we compare, say, 20 years ago with today and say, you know, what did the top 20% get today versus 20 years ago, what the bottom 20% get? By those kinds of measures, yeah. I mean, I think there there is inequality and measured that way, it's probably increasing. But but that ignores a whole bunch of issues uh, that, that we might want to think about here. One, it, it ignores uh, income mobility. It's not the same people who are rich in year one as in year 20. And it's especially not the same people who are poor in year one as in year 20. So people frequently start out poor uh, and, and most people work their way out of poverty over the course of some number of years. So when we say you know, in, inequality is increasing, it's not like the people who started rich are all of a sudden richer and the people who started poor are suddenly poor, right? So, so that's the mobility question is part of it. The other question is, what about absolute living standards? As your your Cato colleagues at humanprogress.org have so aptly demonstrated, right? Uh, you know, poor and 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 middle class Americans, and I've contributed to this literature too, live you know live way better than we did in the 1970s. I'm old enough to remember the 1970s. I know things are better now, um, and in fact, poor Americans today, by a number of measures, live better uh, in material terms than than American than average Americans did. 40 years ago. So even if it's the case that inequality is growing, should that bother us if the real uh, real ability of the poor to consume and, and to sort of have material goods and other sorts of things, right, is better than it used to be? Sort of why are we worried about inequality is another question. And I think the last issue is to the degree it's true that inequality is increasing, to, to what degree has that been the result? of what we might call, you know, regressive regulations, uh, things like zoning laws and occupational licensure and minimum wage and so on that, that make it more difficult for, for folks who start out poor to, to, to get richer and, and, who, and that, you know, sort of redist and other po kinds of policies that redistribute from the, from the poor to the rich, corporate bailouts and, and all those kinds of things. So I think, you know, when you start asking those kinds of questions, um, the inequality debate looks a lot more complicated than, than the rich are getting rich, the poor are getting poor. This question is fairly abstract. So let me see if I can try to make it make sense. But you earlier on, you you talked about how when we're, we're kind of looking at the this economic way of thinking, we're looking at people's preferences and they're trying to satisfy their preferences within a system of all sorts of constraints and scarcity. And so how are they going to behave? Um, what decisions are they going to make? And and so there's on that side of economics, there's a, it's a descriptive side. So you can, as an economist, you can say, look, this is you know this is this is how I think the world works, um, and I can use that to describe phenomenon that are happening. But economists um, and that all the people in this building at Cato who do economics work are making normative assertions as well. They're saying like. Not just this is how things work, but here's how they ought to work, or here's how you, whether you're a policymaker or a person out, another kind of person out in the world, ought to behave. Um, that those are all about if preferences vary, right? Like people, I have different preferences than you do, and we we can kind of talk about our preferences without valuing them differently. But in order to make these normative claims that economists make, or when we say like we ought to free up markets, you know, and it's wrong to overregulate or it's wrong to restrict people's economic choices or whatever, there's a there's a value system at work there. And so how are we what are what are those values? Is it simply just maximizing people's preference satisfaction is always good and does that value then play into these kind of concerns that we have where we say you know like this this is wrong from an economic standpoint but maybe maybe the public simply has say different a set of different values um, and so it's not wrong from the perspective of those values yeah well okay so I, I think I think sort of uh, trying to set as far as many people's preferences as possible is part of the story, right? Um, but I think 
uh, we have to even maybe step back one more abstract from that, right? That that it, the way I often put it is, if, if we want a world of sort of peace, prosperity, and social cooperation, that is, if we want a world of progress, basically, if we want a world where where uh, you know human beings live longer and and better and more fulfilled lives, if we want a world, especially where where the uh, where uh, we reduce the number of absolutely poor people. Um, if we want all of those things, then what economics can tell us is what sets of institutions are most likely to produce those kinds of outcomes in general, right? So, so the normative part becomes, look, you know, to, to, to people who might sort of think that you need government intervention to do X, Y, or Z, right? often the response is to say, well, okay, uh, I understand the goal you want to achieve here, but the intervention is not going to achieve that goal. And in fact, letting markets work and, and under the right institutional framework is much more likely to achieve it. So, you know, we take simple examples like rent control. If, if the idea is how do we how do we make sure there's plenty of affordable housing for people? Well, rent control is not going to do that. It's going to create shortages. It's going to reduce the quality of housing. It's going to allow give all the power to landlords, right? Because the, anytime you have a shortage economy, the seller has power. Um, instead, right, if we want to think through how, I, I, you might say, I agree with your goal here, of creating more affordable housing for people, but let's look at the ways in which, for example, the supply of housing is being restricted by zoning laws, by you know, historical preservation laws, by all kinds of things, right? That, 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 that uh, NIMBY stuff that make it hard to create more housing and, and in, in so doing, bring the, bring the price down. Right. So just as an example, I think you know, it, we, can, we can share those general goals and then the normative judgment comes in because one has that set of goals, that, that set of you know, call moral values, whatever one wants to call them. Right? Um, and you can't escape that at some level, uh, that that's always part of the story. And, and I think you know, you, 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 part of the argument for economists is if we want to achieve those things, here are the institutions and here are the practices we think are best to do that. Is that, um, is yeah. that the kind of thing you were thinking about there? Yeah, I guess. I mean, so to give give a kind of an example of where this we might. So we we argue, you know, that we should that increasing immigration brings with it often enormous positive economic growth and all sorts of other benefits. That you know, a country that that has much more liberalized immigration is going to be wealthier, see more economic growth, um, better labor markets, and so on. Um, and and we say, you know, so therefore, if you want to restrict immigration, you're just you're just hurting yourself, you're hurting the country. Um, and but those those kind of economic arguments for immigration seem to depend on you know what people care about is increasing wealth, um, when it might be that they care about. Other things that they place they place value in something other than economic growth, and instead want you know solidarity or uh, more of a static culture or certain values, or you know we rail against we rail against tariffs because tariffs look like you know just mind-numbingly dumb economic policy, um, but maybe maybe it's because we don't. Uh, we free marketers don't value, you know, American industry and the the very fact that Americans are employed doing things. Even if as a result we, you know, t-shirts are more expensive or whatever, um, or you know, staplers. It's it's good to have staplers made in Pennsylvania, even if those staplers are bad, simply because they're American staplers. Um, and and so that's that's where I guess I get to this. This question of value is that it feels like a lot of the time economists are are simply saying to people, um, either, you know, so the, on the one hand there's the argument you gave, which is you know you can take you can take their values as they're they are and say, but you're you're mistaken about how to maximize those, how to fulfill those, um, you're you're getting the details wrong. But a lot of the time it also feels like ec economists are basically saying, well, those aren't things that you should value as much as you should value maximizing right. wealth. So, so two, th I'd say two things about that. I think at, at some level, right, if someone makes the argument you just made, right, I, I want them to make that argument eyes wide open. I want them to look at me and say, yes, I think we should make staplers in America because having American industry is good. And I, and, and I understand that it will impoverish 
many of my fellow citizens, uh, and it will put them at each other's throats because, because they're fighting over a shrinking pie. But I think it's so important that, that I'm willing to pay that price. I, if someone says that to me, I can't argue with them, right? Because they're not wrong. You know, that, that is a, val it's a value judgment, right? Their value saying they prefer those other things to, you know, to the, to the sort of peace, prosperity, and social cooperation. So, so you know, at, at, at that level, I, I can't, you can't. And, and again, you know, Mises made this point too, right? Where he said, if, if someone doesn't, isn't interested in, in those other good things, you, you're, you're never going to, you can't persuade them of, of the, you know, that your means are the right means to that end. I do think another point though, that I, it's worth mentioning here is, uh, you know, you, you, you you can't eat GDP, right? But you got you to gotta have many of the other things that people often say they value are, are possible because we have, have a materially progressing economy, right? Um, we, we, talk, we, you know, we talk about how much we value people's health, right? But, but unless you've got, in the broad sense of the term, economic growth, you, you can't get the resources you won't get the innovation to provide the medicines and so on that 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 can cure diseases and, and keep people healthy. Um, so in that sense, right? I, and I do think many economists make the mistake of sounding like material stuff is the end point. That's the goal. But but for me, it's 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 those that that even that is a means to these other kinds of things. And I, I love the word progress here. I think the word progress, even though we can't often define it very precisely. Uh, maybe like pornography, we know it when we see it. Uh, but but that's the thing, right? We, you know, progress means to me means means getting better at all those things that human beings care about. Another thing that economists often discuss is <clears throat> how the price system lets goods go to their highest and best uses uh, in many ways that if someone really wants to purchase some piece of land to put a factory on it, that demonstrates that it's the highest and best use of that land over a different use of the land. <clears throat> but does, does money really actually correlate to those kind of values? This goes with Aaron's question. If, if Rush were to announce a concert and come to your hometown to play and you're a huge Rush fan and you would want to get in line to buy Rush tickets, but also you make mistakenly bet on Michigan to get in the college football playoffs. So you lost all you're, of your money. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm doubling down on this. So you lost all of your money. You literally have no money. Uh, and so you can't buy a Rush ticket, but you are actually the biggest Rush fan. Uh, rush tickets are not going to the biggest Rush fans, and they're they're going to people who have a lot of money who may not be the biggest Rush fans. So is that is that a just way of distributing something like Rush tickets or something else like food, where we're not we're distributing it by how much money you have, and not by how much you actually need it or want it? Right. So, uh, all right. When I teach this sort of idea in intro, it's a great, great to loop us back to where we were sort of talking more concretely about teaching. When I teach this, when, when I teach about the role that prices play as sort of, you know, uh, allocators of, uh, in the way that, that we're talking about, um, one of the things I do is I, I say to the class, look, let's think about all the ways that we could allocate resources, right? Prices are one, right? Paying money for something is one. I said, imagine we have a big pile of stuff in the middle of the floor here, right? How can we divide it up? How can we determine who gets it? And, and you know, they'll quickly come up with some ways, right? We can, uh, so we can distribute it randomly. We could, you know, is, does your driver's license end in an even or an odd number? We could have you line up, right? That's another one. We could, we could ask you to write an essay about why, you know, <laughs> why you're the world's biggest rush fan, right? Why you deserve this. Right. We could talk about some notion of need or, or, you know, we could also play fight club. Right. I just say, you know, come get it. Right. And and, and you guys could come down here and, and, and you know, get into a, a big old rumble over it, too. And, and one of the things I say is all of those are at least potential ways of, 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 of allocating resources. In that sense, none of them are wrong. OK. They have costs and they have trade-offs, right? I mean, you know, people who can afford to wait in line will benefit from the line waiting system. People who have much more brute strength than I do will benefit from a from Fight Club, right? Although I do point out to them, the, you know, if you go with Fight Club, the first thing people are going to do is spend lots of resources on baseball bats and right whatever to, you know, and suddenly we're 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 getting very costly a very costly allocation system. Whatever the costs and benefits of all of those, 
using prices to allocate resources, whatever flaws it has, and you've identified one, right? It, you might have a deep desire for something, but if you don't have the money, you can't express that in the way, in the, in the lingua franca, right? In the way that matters. But the huge advantage of the price system is, unlike all the rest of them, the price system also encourages people to supply more of the thing. Right. When when prices change and when people are willing to pay high, you know, a lot for something that sends a signal that encourages greater supply. Even in my example. Right. You know, I assumed that there was this pile of stuff on the floor that we're going to allocate, which leaves open the question, where's the next pile of stuff going to come from? And the price system solves both of those problems. It helps us allocate the existing pile of stuff and helps us gives us an incentive to create more. One of its flaws is what you've identified. But but a system that did what, you know, even as much as I might think that I would have the most, you know, uh, powerful claim for front row tickets to, to this Imagine Rush concert, even if I couldn't afford it because I'm such a long time devoted fan. Right. Uh, you know, that, that's certainly uh, that's a you know, I might imagine, again, myself having that. Right. But that's not going to that doesn't make rush tickets appear right in the way that being willing to pay for them. Uh, does willing and able to pay for them does so yeah I mean it's a it's a problem with allocating by price and by monetary exchange uh, but that's a I think that's a smaller problem than the problem that all problems that all those other systems face. Uh, continuing this topic of of economic education, we've we've talked throughout this episode about you teaching students, but but there's also I mean we. You're now economics editor for libertarianism.org. You know we at the Cato Institute are, are trying to communicate these ideas to to the broader public, not just university students, um, and and we're trying to do it from this obvious perspective of economic liberalism, of pro free markets, of libertarianism. So there are there, I guess, what do we as libertarians are the things that we do wrong when we're communicating these ideas? Are there, are there ways that we could be better? at communicating economic ideas? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, we're still – I want to put this carefully. We're still overly plagued by the Randian virus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was the I careful way of putting it? <laughs> libertarians tend to talk about free markets and, and economic ideas sort of in terms of of both the heroic individual or, or that markets enable me to get the stuff I want right that that kind of way of talking or and and, and not again moving away from 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 uh, Rand or or as we were talking about before or in terms of this sort of very materialistic kind of measure of things and I think I think we would do ourselves a better favor if we were to do a couple of things, we would be better off talking about, again, economics as this realm of human choice, where we all have different preferences, different knowledge, we're all facing constraints, and we're all trying to talk to each other and figure out how, how to make the best use possible of the, of the stuff, the limited stuff that we have, right? That's, that's the challenge, right? It's, it's, it's figuring that out. And also framing that in terms of the reason we think that markets work well and that one needs to understand economics so that one can appreciate that is precisely because it's about these questions of progress and particularly these questions of progress for the least well off. I mean, we have one of the most amazing accomplishments of the last couple decades is the dramatic drop in global poverty. And, and I, I have no doubt that that is due to the general sort of freeing of economies across the globe, in particular freeing of trade across the globe. Right has has um, has has just it's in, if you brought someone back from thirty years ago it's incredible what's happened right and and sort of reminding as libertarians reminding people that the reason we care about freedom in general but certainly the reason we care about economic freedom and economic liberalism um, is because it improves people's lives and most and and disproportionately improves the lives of 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 the least well off among us and so I think there's a there's a rhetoric there's some rhetorical challenges there that that we're not always really really good about I, and one other thing I should mention too I think there is uh, a tendency among libertarians when they talk about economics to separate the world into you know kind of Austrians and some Chicago school economists over here and everyone else is a Keynesian socialist over there right and and it's just so it's so frustrating the way in which 
you know, libertarians are quick to demonize uh, and and sort of overly simplify. What are what are more complicated things than that? I mean, the you know, just there's plenty of non-Austrian, non-Chicago economists out there who are appreciative of markets and who are not, in fact, Keynesians. Those are sort of orthogonal to each other. I even saw on Facebook today, you know, uh, apparently Krugman's doing this online course of some sort, right? And someone, I think, was joking, but I never know, but between libertarians and my Facebook, I never know, but sort of said, oh, wouldn't it be kind of cool to get some libertarian friends together and take this class and, and you know, and sort of suggesting that they would, you know, be critical of Krugman. We'd probably get thrown out, right? And I'm like, guys, you would be the first ones yelling if a group of students walked into my classroom and did that to me. Why, why, you know? And, the guy's got a Nobel Prize for a reason. His New York Times columns are terrible. Yeah, he's become a partisan ideologue. Yes, but he actually seriously contributed to our economic understanding. And Pop Internationalism is a great book. So, you know, that kind of stuff, as you can see, my blood pressure is starting to rise. Um, that kind of stuff drives me crazy. When, when there's, In fact, there's a, another meme out there. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a Homer Simpson one, right? And it's him sort of lying in bed with a smoke and a cigar. And the caption something like, what libertarians are like after they read one economics book, right? Suddenly they know everything. And I'm like, no, you don't. You don't. And 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 I know your heart's in the right place. And I and I'm I'm glad that you think economic freedom is important. But but in fact, you, you just you know you probably don't know as much as you think you do. And and you need a little bit of humility just to sort of be willing to 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 sort of understand that it's it's probably more complicated than you think it is. Well, with with all of that in mind, uh, let's turn to this this new role that you have taken on as as economics editor at libertarianism dot org, uh, which, as I said at the beginning, is is kicking off this month. Can you tell our listeners what your goals are as economics editor, and maybe what they can expect to see? Yeah, I I think what what I would like. What I'm asking people to contribute, let's put it that way, um, and so that I think reflects the vision, um, is 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 I want to I want that site to be able to do one thing mostly and the second thing a little bit mostly to explain and explore key economic concepts in a way that's accessible and useful to to precisely the kind of people we were just talking. About that right sort of you know lib libertarians who are not especially knowledgeable about economics but genuinely sincerely want to learn more um and so I, so this is you know primarily an exercise in in understanding a concept from economics understanding something about the history of economics that's the story we were we were talking about a little bit earlier uh, uh you know and i think there, there's space in there too for for application type pieces but but for me that the focus of even of those would be on, on on making sure we understand the principle or we understand the concept or we understand how economists talk about these things and, and all with an eye towards right why does this matter for people who care about about economic liberty um i hope you know and i'm encouraging my contributors to to, to sort of write in a way that that while it's clear the liberty content is clear it's not so heavy-handed and overwhelming that these things couldn't be useful in a classroom, right? Because I think, you know, good economists who can write well and write something like this, um, that becomes a, a piece on the web that can be shared in ways that, that uh, I think would be really useful and that students might, might, might uh, uh, really get a lot out of. So I expect these to be in that sense somewhat didactic, but, but I'm hoping to get writers who are also outstanding teachers and who can, who can explain these concepts in, in clear and accessible and clever ways with, with excellent uh, illustrative examples. Uh, and we'll do, you know, I think the, some of them will be sort of short blog posty op-ed length type things, you know. 800 words, but I but I have some ideas for longer form pieces that that I hope I can see uh, appear in the next over the next bit. So so yeah, I think it'll be a wide range of stuff. Um, but I think it I think of it as a resource for libertarians who want to expand their knowledge of economics uh, and want it in a form that again is, is clear and accessible. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.